without any further ado, if you've just joined us, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar series. Uh, this is Differentiated Instruction Using Adaptive Tools. That's the webinar series that we're currently holding up. And thank you for your time and being here today. My name is Sarah Shuja and I'm a Marketing Manager at McGraw-Hill. Um, before we begin this session, I just want to give you a brief overview of what we will be covering today. Um, you must have seen this is an engaging session and we will be talking about ways in which McGraw-Hill ELA intervention solutions can meet the needs of all learners. And this is like whether you're following an accelerated multidimensional learning approach where your students are controlling the speed and the method in which you teach or the scaffolding in instructional method and your students have a more greater independence in learning or you're using both. You will basically learn how you can apply it in your classroom using McGraw-Hill programs. The duration of this session is 60 minutes. And just to let you know, we have other sessions lined up for you as well uh, in the month of April. And we have one that's tomorrow for wonders. It's called Effective Planning and Implementation of Differentiated Learning in ELA. You can find out more details on the registration page. Me or, me or my colleague can drop the link in the chat box for you. Um, in the chat for you and you can register there. Oops, moving on. Um, I'm your moderator for today along with my colleague Hamad Khilji who's the head of marketing and we will be here in the background to help you support you if you have any questions or you're facing any technical difficulties please feel free to let us know in the in the Q&A box or the chat box and we can we can do our best to support you. I have a very special guest with us today it's Beverly Trent. I hope I got the name correct or the pronunciation correct? Okay, amazing. Um, and Beverly is joining us from Florida, is it? Yes, I am. <laughs> She's a national curriculum specialist at McGraw-Hill and has over 20 years of experience in education. She's also been the director of training, development, and coaches, teachers, instructional techniques. So we're here to learn more from her about all those techniques, instructions for all the students. Um, Beverly also delivers teacher training focused on literacy, um, mathematics, and direct instructions. Thank you so much for your time and being with us today, Beverly. Yes, happy to be here. Amazing. <laughs> and I just want to remind you, um, your chat box is actually set to host and panelist. If you can just click on the drop down here and just select it to everyone so you can interact with your colleagues and peers and everyone in the session today. And we want to make this as interactive as possible. So engage with us, talk to the presenter. Um, we want to make this as engaging and we need your support for it. So just click on the drop down here. Oops, sorry, that's a mess. And just select everyone and everyone in the session will be able to see your, see your comments. And I guess that's it from me. Me and my colleague are here in the background if you need any kind of support. I can stop sharing my screen at this point. Thank you. Over to you, Beverly. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good. Um, it's it's morning here in the United States, and I believe it's afternoon over um, where most of you are probably about two o'clock or later. So um, in your chat box, I just dropped a couple of things and I'm going to talk about those in just a moment. Um, so what, we've, what we have for you today is just a fun, um, hopefully as engaging as possible. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very early in the morning, so I'm still waking up. A fun, very engaging presentation to show you how we provide scaffolded support or acceleration throughout our developmental and our intervention programs. Um, one of the things that I dropped in your chat box was a tiered solutions brochure for intervention and acceleration. I also dropped in the chat box um, a link to our intervention and our acceleration uh, website page. So um, you should be able to see both of those. I dropped them in twice early, early in the session. I have them there if you scroll all the way to the top. And then later on, just not long ago at 6.06 .06 a.m. Uh, via my time. So that would be probably 2.06 p.m. your time. 
Um, and then, you know, just a bit ago, I also dropped the brochure in there as well. So I would encourage you because we, we don't, what we don't want to do today is go, we have this program and this program and this program. We are going to show you some of our most for, more phenomenal programs, but what we want to do is show you how we keep students engaged through those programs and what type of scaffolded support um, those programs provide for your students. Um, so again, if you have any problems, um, accessing either that PDF, that brochure, or getting the uh, link to the website, just let me know and I can drop them in again at the end of the session. Um, but that is going to tell you all about all the many different types of acceleration and intervention type programs that we have at McGraw-Hill. Um, many, many more than I'm going to be able to show you or talk to you about today. So um, without further ado, let's get the ball rolling. So the first couple of programs that I want to talk to you about and show you engaging examples from um, that would provide both intervention and acceleration for your students come from our open court reading program. Um, and so we have what we call the foundational skills kit and we also have a word analysis kit. And I'm gonna show you some fun and ex engaging examples from these programs in just a moment. Um, but as you can see, grade K um, talks all or works all about the foundation for reading with phonemic awareness, concepts of print and the alphabetic principle. Grade one builds on that foundation with sound spelling correspondence and grades two and three reinforce and expand on that fluency decoding and encoding skills. Now what's wonderful about the open court foundational skills kits and what you'll see later on the word analysis kits is these are uh, kits that can be purchased that can support any core one program in the development of foundational skills and word analysis skills. Um, so you can use any program out there, whether it's Wonders, Open Core, Reading Mastery, even a program that's not McGraw-Hill, you could still use these programs. And again, they're very engaging and they provide um, a nice little space for tier two intervention or even acceleration. If you had some students that were ready to, to, to jump a little further, you could start a little further along in the kit um, and provide some enrichment for students at grade level. Um, so he, I'm going to talk to you about grades four and five and the word analysis kits in just a little bit. And again, this is not a, a, a program lecture, but we do need to show you certain features at certain times, just so you're aware of the program and how it's organized. Because if we just show you fun and engaging examples, you may not exactly see how the program is put together. Um, so K through three doing a lot of what I just spoke about on the previous slide. So you can see where in K we're working on that print awareness, letter recognition, also in grade one. But as you get to grades two and three, you're working more with fluency and vocabulary and language development. So how do we do that? What are some of the fun, engaging ways that we use to do that? And pardon me just a moment. I'm noticing that my laptop wants to die here, so I just need to plug it in. So give me just a moment here. My sincere apologies, that always happens at the most unfortuitous time. So, um, so what I'm going to show you first is um, we use a lot of puppetry in our um, open court program and also our foundational skills kits. Puppetry engages students. Um, I don't have my puppet with me today because one of my little tutoring students took it home. And this little guy is not showing so well, but he's a little black stuffed dog. So we're going to use him today in place of our puppet. Um, but pu puppetry really helps students, particularly when they're learning phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. It's really fun to use puppets to help students learn. And one of the things that we uh, work with our teachers on in both uh, Open Court and some later programs that I'm going to show you that use puppetry as well, is when you are using the puppet, if he is um, talking about something that's on the beginning of a word, um, then you want him to be on your left hand side. Um, and if he's doing something that's on the end of a word, you want him to be on your, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. If you're doing something that's on the beginning of the word, you want him to be on your right hand side. And if you're doing something that's on the end of the word, you want him to be on your left hand side. And that's because we want to model that left to right progression for the students. They should always be seeing left to right progression, whether you're using pronunciation type um, fingers or you're using your puppet. Okay. So you can kind of see this is a, um, this is a, 
a procedure card that we use quite a bit in um, open court FSKs, um, also in open court, where the teacher is going to follow a particular procedure to help the students learn a particular skill. So here we're dealing with phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, and they're learning how to uh, blend with some consonant blends. And so looking in the middle here, you, we're just doing a little practice. If I say and my little Henry puppet here is going to say no. So, no. So, the word would be snow, right? Okay. So, if I say and Henry says low, then it would be slow and put it together. We have slow. Do you think you have it? Do it with me. All right. So, let's do some more examples. So, b low put it together and you have yes blow let's do another one t ray put it together and you have yes tray let's do some different ones p lane put it together and you have plane yes so lots of engagement for students with uh, puppetry when they're learning about phonemic awareness and phonological awareness to help them learn how to hear and repeat those sounds and those sound patterns that they're hearing in words. So you'll see puppetry quite a bit within our FSK kits. Um, so this is one way that we really work to keep students engaged and to provide that scaffolded approach. Um, so they are learning little bits each day to help them um, progress through those different types of print and book awareness, letter recognition, phonological awareness um, through these types of routines. So obviously phonemic awareness routine, we would have different routines for word recognition and fluency. Um, one of the things that is very unique about our FSK kits and our open court program in general is we use alphabet sound cards and sound spelling cards to keep students engaged. Um, so all of these sound cards and sound spelling cards have little motions that go with them because again it's all about keeping students engaged and having something that helps them to uh, attach to their memory so every single sound spelling card has a movement that goes with it so if i'm talking about a bouncing basketball they would do something like this b b basketball k k clicking camera d d dancing dinosaur. Um, so you can see Cherry the chipmunk there because she's gobbling her cherries. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Rosie the robot, um, she uses um, her little broom. So she is always going along and saying, Rrr. Um, we have a zipper. So all of these sound spelling cards have a motion and a story that attaches to them to help the students remember the sound. And so that motion attached with the sound helps them remember the sound. Um, but that's not all we do. We also show them how those sounds and sound patterns appear in words. So if you're looking at the clicking camera over on the right hand side, you can see that there are three sounds that make the k sound and we kind of show you where they appear on the words. Now there is a rhyme and a reason to why um, some of our, our count cards have a green background. You might see that our vowels have a green background. Well, that's because it's going to show the students in the pattern where a vowel might go. So I know that a vowel is going to come before a CK or before a TCH. So let's see this in action. Let's actually see how the students use the sound spelling cards to help them with spelling. Camera. Carlos has a new camera. When he takes pictures, his camera makes a clicking sound like this. In the garden, Carlos takes pictures of caterpillars crawling on kale. At the zoo, Carlos takes pictures of a camel, a duck, and a kangaroo. In the park, Carlos takes pictures of his cousin flying a kite. In his room, Carlos takes pictures of his cute kitten, Cozy. Can you help Carlos take pictures with his camera? So again, they're learning that motion to go with the sound. So, 
So on the back of every sound spelling card, that little uh, poem that you heard just a moment ago um, about Carlos and his clicking camera, that would appear on the back of that sound spelling card. So the teacher can choose to actively teach it through the card itself and through her own words and her own motions, or she can use our videos that we have available um, to show the, the um, sound spelling card. So let's see the sound spelling cards in action and how they help the students learn how to spell. So this sound is, everybody say it, shh, yes, shh, like in a seashell, right? Okay, so that's a sound combination. Then next we have a vowel. We know that our vowels are green because they help us learn patterns in words. And then we have our k sound. So doing the sounds from left to right, shh, a, k, what word? shack okay and so if you are going to pick one of the combinations here for what would go on the end of shack which one would you most likely choose and hopefully you're saying the middle combination because that is showing you that typically that vowel sound comes in front of that ck okay um, so here's another example of using the sound spelling cards um, so let's look at a different one. We're going to learn how to spell the word bridge. So what's the first sound you hear in bridge? B, 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 the bouncing basketball. And then the next sound you hear in the word bridge, Rosie the robot. And then what's the next sound you hear in the word bridge? It's going to be that I, okay? I, I, I. And the last sound you hear in the word bridge, this one might throw you a little bit as you see it, as it comes up. So Jill is jumping with her jump rope and here are all the different combinations that can come up for the sound j, j, j. So we have not just the typical J, but also the G followed by E, G followed by I. And so bridge, which one of these combinations do you think is most likely going to help me spell the word bridge? And you probably said this, uh, this one right down here at the very bottom because it has that green box in front. A couple more things about our sound spelling cards. If it has a purple strip across the top, that means that that sound is uh, typically the same through many different languages. Um, so that means that that sound is going to be uh, similar in Spanish and other languages that the students might encounter. We have a lot of second language learning students in the States. So these are our sound spelling cards and they're very famous and lots of fun. Um, the kids use them all the time, every single day. The teacher uses them all the time, every single day. Again, they have the fun poetry, um, the motion to help the students remember the sound, and then the different techniques on the card itself to help the students learn how to spell words and use those words, okay? All right. Okay. And then, so let's look at open court reading word analysis kits really quickly. So these are going to build on what you've done in grades K through three. They're going to provide that explicit systematic instruction to help the students learn the basics of reading and writing. They're going to get into word analysis, specifically vocabulary, and continue to build on their fluency. So here students are going to, uh, working, going to be working with manipulatives and print on a daily basis. Um, so looking at our chart again, looking at K through three and remembering that in KM1, we were working on those early skills in grades two and three, we were working more on fluency and vocabulary and decoding. You can see that now that we're in grades four and five, that decoding moves or transfers and in, transforms into word analysis. The fluency is still there. The vocabulary and language development are still there. Um, so sound spelling cards are still going to be around. And here's a couple more examples for you, as you can see. And again, you're seeing that those vowels are green. You're seeing the different patterns that appear on the bottom of the cards. You're seeing a purple strip go across the top of cards where sounds match across languages other than English. Um, so here's some examples of some things that you might see in our word analysis kit. Again, you're going to have that explicit systematic through instruction through those different types of routines that are going to come up every day. You're going to have uh, different types of games that you can play through dice and vocabulary cards. Um, so the students are really, again, going to be more looking at word analysis, 
What is the morphology of words? What do different parts of words mean? What do different suffixes mean on a word? Okay, so that is our open court foundational skills kits at our word analysis kits. And I'm going to continue to uh, show you some more engaging activities as we keep moving on. But that scaffold instruction is already provided for you there through the kit itself, through those wonderful daily lesson plans that you have. Again, this could be provided as intervention in support of any tier one program that's out there, whether it's open court reading, reading master transformation wonders, or a program outside of the McGraw-Hill spectrum um, that you might be using for your reading program. Um, and again, while these program, while these were designed to provide intervention support for students and provide that scaffolded explicit systematic instruction for students, you could certainly use uh, later lessons in the kit to accelerate your students that are already doing well and are ready to maybe uh, move just a little bit further. So let's move forward with talking about um, some of our direct instruction programs that we have out there. Many of you are probably familiar with our direct instruction programs, but if you are not familiar with them, um, anytime you see this little green label that pops up, in our intervention and acceleration catalog, which you can access through the website that I gave you earlier in the training in the chat box, or um, you might see it pop up in the tiered solutions brochure. That means that that's going to be a true direct instruction program um, written by the Engelman Becker Corporation and written by Siegfried Engelman himself. Direct instruction has been around since the 1960s. We've been working on scaffolded instruction and gradual release for many, many decades. And these are some of our more popular programs that many, many uh, schools are using. So the ones up top with Reading Mastery Signature, our language series, which if you've heard of them before, they're programs like Language for Learning, Language for Thinking, Language for Writing, and Reading Mastery Transformations are some of our more developmental programs. And then we also have intervention programs. Now we have many, many direct instruction intervention programs. So I've just highlighted a couple of them here for you, corrective reading and expressive writing, but we have many others. We have programs that go all the way up to essentials for algebra. Um, and we also have programs that, that teach basic reasoning and writing. Uh, we have spelling programs like spelling mastery and spelling through morphographs. Um, so we have all types of developmental and intervention programs. And one of the wonderful factors about direct instruction programs is we use a placement test to place students at their instructional level and then build them up from there. Direct instruction um, keeps students engaged through a very specific type of design and delivery. Um, it's actually unique to the program itself. So first, the thing you need to know before we get into and we look at some of these examples is I want you to remember that nothing is ever assumed in a direct instruction program. We never assume anything in DI. So we use that placement test to place the students based off of where they're performing. And then from that point on, we assume no prior knowledge. So a lot of times students might be uh, presented with some information that they might have partially mastered or they have been exposed to, but maybe not mastered yet. But those complex tasks and skills are broken down so the students are only getting 10% new information each day. Um, the amount of new information is controlled. And if 10% is new, then that means 90% is review. Um, it's never going to be more than 15% new, 85% review. And so that's going to give the students multiple opportunities to be exposed to that content on a daily basis. Now, again, we're going to get into some engaging activities here in just a moment. So just be patient with me here. But our design is what makes us different. We are a scripted type program. Um, so open court reading um, and their, uh, <clears throat> um, their foundational skills kits um, and word analysis kits use routines. They use a guided type of or a suggested language for the teacher. Here, you're going to have a more tightly prescriptive type program, still going to have that gradual release, still going to have that scaffold appro approach that, that I do, we do, you do. Um, but here, the script is not just a suggestion like it is 
in our foundational skills kits and our word analysis kits with open court, but instead it actually is what the teacher should be saying and doing. And I'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a minute. Um, we keep students very engaged in a direct instruction lesson. Students are going to respond over 100 times within 30 minutes of direct instruction. I want you to take a moment and absorb that because we throw a lot of information at you all the time, but over 100 times in 30 minutes of direct instruction. Now compare that to a typical guided reading lesson where you have six to eight students in front of you. Each student might have the opportunity to respond maybe six to eight times each. Um, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. It's too early and I'm still not thinking with my brain. So starting over, which is a good feature we have with direct instruction, we're gonna correct that and start that over and do that the right way. In a typical guided reading lesson with six to eight students in front of you, each student might have the opportunity to respond three to five times each. So three to five times versus a hundred times, which one's going to give me more information about my students? 100 times is correct. And I know you're thinking, well, how in the world do you do that? Um, well, we do that through teaching through the group, using signals, pacing, positive praise to keep our students engaged, um, and then providing that corrective feedback when students make a mistake. Whether it's one, some, or all, we're always going to be listening for those errors, and we're going to be looking at what, what the students did and, and making that correction. So keep in mind, as I'm showing you these examples and we're engaging in these examples in the next few moments, and you're seeing some ideas of, of tasks, um, these things that I was talking about, that these complex tests are broken down. Many of the things that you're going to see, you're going to need to kind of be there in that suspension of belief with me in uh, knowing that any skills that the students needed to be able to do the tasks that we're currently doing have been explicitly taught, practiced, and mastered prior to whatever skill it is we're currently doing. That new, we do this through controlling that new amount of information each day. And remember, we're going to respond over 100 times in 30 minutes of instruction. So I would challenge you to get out your phone or get out your timer right now if you'd like to. And I'm gonna tell you a story about Sam the bunny. And I would engage you, or I would encourage you to engage, boy, I'm just tongue tied this morning for very early in the morning. I would encourage you to engage with me. Um, so one of the things we do quite a bit in reading mastery and in language is we use stories to teach phonemic awareness skills and language skills. So they might be practicing word parts or sounds. They might be listening for what a character did first, next, or last. Um, in our language for thinking program, they're actually get to a point where they're um, visualizing the story in their head and they're thinking about a character walking into the room and they've seen the, a map of the room. And so as they're listening to the story, they're thinking about what's on the left-hand side of the character, what's on the right-hand side of the character. Um, so they're listening for all types of different things in terms of story grammar, language skills, reading skills. So this is just one example that comes from our Reading Mastery Transformations program early on in the grade K lesson. And here the students are practicing putting together sounds to make words. Here we have moved away from continuous blending and now we're going to start to use what we call segmented blending um, where the students are going to hear the sound in isolation with just a small break between each sound and they're going to put it together. Now I told you to get out that timer so hopefully you have. So from the moment that I start the story um, and I'm going to start the story with the phrase here's a story about an animal. I want you to start the timer. Now as you're doing this, I want you to tally every time you make a response, okay? You can do that with your hands or you can do it with a piece of paper right now, but let's, let's challenge this idea of 100 times in 30 minutes. Are you ready to hear a fun story? Here we go. Here's a story about an animal. I'm gonna tell you a story, but you're going to have to help me with the sounds that, that I can, and the words that I can't say fast. Listen. There once was a bunny named S -A -M. Listen to his name again. S -A -M. What's the bunny's name? Yes, Sam. Sam loved to eat. What word? Yes, eat. What did Sam love to do? 
eat. Yes, eat. The bunny's mom said, if you don't stop eating, you won't be able to. Ah, uh, listen again. Ah, uh, what word? Yes, hop. What won't Sam be able to do? Yes, hop. But Sam didn't listen. Sam ate and ate. What did Sam do? Yes, ate and ate. What did Sam do? Yes, eight and eight. One day the other bunny said, let's go hop over. One day the other bunny said, let's go hop over to the pond and have some. Uh, mm. What did they want to do? Fun, yes, they wanted to have fun, that's right. Okay, so the bunnies hopped off to the pond. All of the bunnies, that is, except Sam. Sam said, my legs do not want to g o What wouldn't his legs do? Go, that's correct. At last, Sam got to the pond, but it took him a long time because he could not ah. Uh, what could Sam not do? Hop, that's correct. Yes, hop. When Sam finally got to the pond, the other bunnies were finished playing. They said, well, it's time for us to go back Oh, mm. listen again. Oh, mm. what were they, where were they going? Home, yes, home. Sam had to turn around and go back home. When he got home, he was very tired and he said to himself, is this a lot of fun? Mm. Oh, what word did Sam say? No, that's right. Was Sam having fun? No, he was not. All right, go ahead and stop your timers. And in the chat box right now, will you type for me how many times you tallied up you responded? Those of you who are participating. I, hear, I see a lot of different numbers. So I've seen nine and 23 so far. Some of you that have some of the lower numbers, 22, 10, yep. Yes, yeah. So I had about 15, and so I was multitasking, trying to follow the script, but uh, you may not have counted the same response more than twice if you had a lower number like nine or 10. So for example, when I said, Sam loved to eat, what word? Yes, eat, what does Sam love to do? Yes, eat. We would count both of those as a response, even though they're saying the same word two times in a row. Um, so that is correct. The students are constantly responding. They're responding. Our goal is to have them responding about 10 to 12 times in a minute. So as we keep doing additional activities today, I want you to uh, look at how many times the students are responding. Now, here I was following a script. You were just looking at some pictures of Sam the bunny that the students engage with later on in their storybook. Um, so the teacher would actually uh, talk to the students and they would talk about the parts of the story. What part of the story does this show? What part of the story does this show? So obviously this is the beginning where Sam's mother is telling him not to keep eating and eating. And here the bunnies are going off to play at the pond and Sam is behind because he can't hop. And there would be another picture that the students would look at as well. So after they hear the story orally, they talk about it in parts. But let's continue to look at some different ways that reading mastery keeps students engaged. So everything we do is scripted. So what you say is in blue, what you do is in parentheses, and the black italics is in um, is the expected student response. You'll see further examples of scripts a little bit later on. Now this actually comes from an upper level of reading mastery in grades three and four, where the students are learning about morphology and they're learning about word parts and what they mean in words. So different words can stand alone within a big word, some of them cannot. And what you're seeing here in these areas that have a white box with a beige background are actual displays that the teacher would be showing up on a screen. So the students wouldn't see the script, but I wanted you to see the script. Um, what I was following back here with Sam the Bunny was a script similar to that, but you couldn't see it, okay? Um, so if you're looking just alone on this page, every time I see the word signal, and right here alone in this first area, 
I can see that's when students are responding. So look, one, two, three, four, five times students are responding. So again, just a little bit of suspension of belief here. If you could imagine that each time we're working with one of these particular boxes, you as a student are looking at that word up on the board. So for this first part, the students will be looking at the word reacting. Now remember, we never assume anything in direct instruction, scaffolded support, gradual release, I do, we do, you do, placement tests to place them where they are and bring, and then we bring them up to uh, the level of mastery that they need to be to catch them up or to provide acceleration. Um, so they've had some obvious work with morphology prior to this type of exercise that you see here. They're used to looking at a word and breaking it into parts. So you have to understand that there are things that have been done to build the students up to this point. But again, the students would be looking at the word reacting on the board and the teacher would say to the kids, what word? Yes, reacting. What's the first morphograph? Yes, re. Next morphograph. Yes, at. Next morphograph. Yes, ing. Which morphograph in this word could stand alone? Think. Get ready. Yes, at. So right there we saw quickly responding, many, many responses right there. So then I would next flash up the word rejecting. And you would notice that um, the act has now been replaced by jet. Okay, and you can see that that's colored for the students. So new word, boys and girls, everybody look at it. What word? Yes, rejecting. Tell me which morphograph in this word could stand alone. Think about it. Get ready. That's right, none of them can stand alone. Which morphograph took the place of the morphograph that could stand alone? Get ready. Yes, ject. Spell ject, get ready. Remember, ject is a morphograph that cannot stand alone. So many times they are learning that particular morphographs have meaning or can stand alone, and they're learning how to break up those words through that morphology. So they continue on with more morphographs, sept, tect, and gress, and looking at how they appear in words like reception, rejection, so forth and so on. So that's some word analysis that you would see in reading mastery transformations, okay? Now, we don't just expect our students to uh, look at words and read about words and study words. So they are learning about phonological awareness and they're learning about word attack skills, whether it's sounding out a word, spelling a word, breaking the word down, but we also provide them with background knowledge that they need to understand the stories that they are reading every single day. In Reading Mastery Signature Edition and in Reading Mastery Transformations Edition, grades two through five, which are upper grade levels, the students are generally exposed to nonfiction type text every single day. And one of the newest features of our Transformations Edition is live videos that the students can engage with. Uh, many times, these programs are being used with students who come from lower socioeconomic communities. And so they don't have the proper background or schema. They've ne maybe never traveled outside of their small little town or city that they live in. I live in Florida. I, as a child, never saw snow. I never knew what a basement was in a house, which, you know, obviously is a room underneath the house. We don't have basements here because most of our houses are sitting on top of very unstable stand, sand. Um, and so I, as a child, didn't really have a visual conceptual uh, understanding of what a basement in a house was and what it was used for or what snow looked like or felt like or sounded like. And so we tried to give them that experience. So when they're learning about Kathy and Linda being stranded on an island, um, they look and, and hear about palm trees and how they move within a storm system. Um, so they can see those palm trees and they can see how they're moving within a hurricane or a storm system. Um, that's one example. Here's another example of a symphony. Not all of our uh, videos have just um, motion, but some of them also have sound. So if the students had never heard a symphony before, they could hear one. And 
I'll stop it there. It goes on and on. But we really try to make sure that we're building that background knowledge. We're building that schema so the students can truly understand our characters and what they're going through in their stories every single day. Again, in DI, we assume no prior knowledge. So we want to make sure that the students know about the eye of a fly and how it sees and how it sees differently from the eye of a human being because we have a lovable character named Herman the fly that likes to travel around the world on airplanes. And while they're learning about Herman the fly, they're learning about the globe and they're learning about hemispheres and directions like north, east, west, and south. They're learning about um, atmospheric pressure and how air changes as it um, goes up or down, as the plane goes up or down. So these fun little videos and these displays help students to visually and sometimes orally grasp what something looks like or sounds like that they haven't been exposed to before. So that was Reading Mastery and some of the fun things that we do in Reading Mastery. And Reading Mastery is, of course, a K through five um, core program that can be used as a replacement core or it can be used as an intervention or acceleration program. Many times we've taken it in a school and we placement test all of our students and they have what's called a walk to read every morning where they just go to wherever it is they need to go. So I've had second graders that were reading at a third grade level go up to a reading mastery three class. I've had the opposite. I've had third graders that were reading on a first grade level go down to a first grade class. Um, and so that's the wonderful thing about Reading Mastery is, again, students can go to the place where they need to go to receive that intervention or that acceleration. The scaffold and instruction is built within the program. That gradual release is there within the program. And that high engagement is there for your students within the program. Um, let's continue to dive more into some examples of looking at how we keep our students engaged. Um, so I just saw, I'm trying to check this chat box very so often. Um, so I see WPM. What does WPM stand for? Words per minute. Okay, so if you see WCPM, that's word correct per minute. WPM is words per minute. And I'll keep trying to pull up that chat box as we're working throughout today. So this is corrective reading. Corrective reading is a wonderful program that it was built to be an intervention program for students in grades three through 12. But the comprehension strand provides a lot of opportunities for acceleration for students that are doing really well at the intermediate levels in grades four through eight. And I'll talk to you about that quickly. So again, not trying to lecture to you about products. I'm gonna show you some examples here very soon, but you need to have a little bit of a background knowledge on the program itself before we get into it. So in corrective reading, we actually have two different strands. We have what's called the decoding strand and we have um, the comprehension strand. So the decoding strand is separated into four levels. Now we use a placement test to determine what level the students would go into. And they might place as low as a non-reader or they might place as high as a decoding C student who is what we call a word caller. They read really, really well. They read cleanly, but when they read, they don't understand what it is that they're reading. Um, and so depending upon where they're reading, they would be placed into one of these four levels. Every single level with the exception of decoding C has 65 lessons. So it's meant to be done in half of a school year. Um, and again, the idea is catch up growth. So if I have a third grader that's a non-reader, they would start with decoding A at the beginning of the school year and then move into decoding B1 in the middle of the school year. And so by the end of the year, they would have gone from being a non-reader to reading 90 words a minute at a beginning third grade level. Um, so, and then our decoding C level, is our level that's our year long level and it has about 125 lessons. Now these programs do a lot of the fun things that you saw in Reading Mastery, but on a much more mature level. So do we don't have pictures of fuzzy bunnies like Sam. Um, instead, the students are looking at word attack skills and, and types of reading skills that they would need to be successful in grades three through 12. The comprehension program, which I'll show you examples of as well, um, is separated also into four programs. We have comprehension A, B1 and B2, and comprehension C. The reason I have comprehension B1 and B2 pictured together here is because the students can't place in B2. They have to place in A, B1, or C. Um, but when you're thinking about these types of skills and the, and the thinking skills that they provide for students, 
always kind of think of it this way. Comprehension A is those very early, early elementary school skills that they need um, to understand basic things like classification. What does a container do? It's made to hold things. What does a vehicle do? It's made to take you places. Um, into comprehension B1 and B2 are going to be those later elementary, early middle skill thinking skills. So they're going to have things like analogies, deductions. They're going to be really working on their auditory memory. They're going to be working on writing. Um, they'll be shown a picture and they'll be asked to do uh, to write a story about what happened before the picture and what happened after the picture. And then when you're looking at comprehension C, this is your later middle school and high school type um, level. So I said that to you because, again, many times we're using these particular um, levels in corrective reading to provide acceleration for our students, you might have, again, a walk to read situation, like I talked about with reading mastery, where the first hour of every school day, the students are going to a walk to read, and they're either going to an intervention class or an acceleration class. So if you have elementary and middle school students that don't need these decoding grade levels because they're already decoding on grade level, you could give them a placement test for one of the comprehension levels, and they could go and be challenged. We've seen many, many fourth and fifth graders ch challenged by the content that they see in comprehension B1. We've seen many seventh and eighth graders challenged by the content that they see in comprehension C. And again, going to that intervention website that I provided you earlier in the chat box, and looking at that tiered solutions brochure would provide you more information beyond what I'm giving you today in our quick little uh, time together. So here's some examples. Let's just be engaged again. And again, thinking about what I'm doing as a teacher, looking at the scaffolded approach, looking at uh, how many times the students are responding. So in decoding A, when students are learning about sounds and sounds and words, they're going to be doing a lot of oral tasks in a, as a, in in addition to written tasks. So they're not only gonna be looking at words on a page and sounding them out and saying them fast, but they're gonna be working with those words again orally. So the students would never see a script like this, but be students with me, please. Um, and I'll be the teacher. So again, thinking about how many times you're responding. So here we go, listen. Fee, say the sounds in fee, get ready. Say it fast. What word? Yes, fee. So look right there, you were responding several times just alone. Now you can see down here in step five, it tells me that I'm gonna repeat that for all of these words, if, fish, Sam, at, and me. So let's imagine, for example, because I want you to see a correction procedure really quickly and how we correct students. Let's imagine that when we get to the word fish, some of you said fist or something different. I want you to watch how I correct it, okay? So I'm gonna go on starting with the word if, but when we get to fish, I'm gonna pretend that you made a mistake when you say it fast, okay? So listen, if, say the sounds in, if, get ready, say it fast. What word? Yes, if, listen. Fish, say the sounds in fish, get ready, say it fast, what word, yes, fish, oh, I told you we we're going to make a mistake and I didn't even think to correct you there, so let's go on to Sam and I'm going to pretend that you say sat, say the sounds in Sam, get ready, say it fast, my turn, Sam. Say it fast. Yes, Sam. Let's go back and say the sounds in Sam. Get ready. Again, get ready. Say it fast. Yes, Sam. Good. We're going to go back, students. So let's do it over and do it better. Say the sounds in if. Get ready. Say it fast. What word? Yes, if. Say the sounds in fish. Get ready. Say it fast. What word? Yes, fish. Say the sounds in 
Sam. Get ready. Say it fast. What word? Yes, Sam. Excellent job remembering that word. That word is Sam. I'm going to award some student points for working hard and doing it over and doing it better. And so we would award some points for our students on the board uh, with a fun little game we call play called the teacher student game. So again, you see lots of engagement, um, lots of times for the students to respond. Now we don't always teach to the group. Um, what you're not seeing here is many times at the end of an exercise, we're going to give individual terms. Now remember that we have that unique design. We're only giving 10% new each day. So the students are getting individual terms at the end of each exercise where they might be asked to sound out and say fast one of these words. We don't have to call on all of our students in our group. We generally call on about a third to half of them and then we move on to the next exercise. But it's wonderful because you have 90% review. The students have an opportunity to get an individual term with lots of different exercises throughout um, their time in the program. Here's an example of what they might see in decoding B1 and B2. They spend a lot of time looking at parts of sounds in words. Um, so this is an actual student page. And again, this is lesson 26. They've built up to this. Um, prior to this, all the way back at lesson one, they were looking at sounds in isolation. They've been taught that CH together says ch. They've been taught that ER together says er. So again, there's some prior instruction that's happened that's built them up to this point. But here in an exercise like this with part one, I might say to my students, everybody touch part one, touch the first word. You're going to say the sound for the underlying part and then say the word. Everybody, what sound? What word? Yes, ranch. Next word, what sound? What word? Yes, faster. Next word, what sound? What word? My turn, that word is chopped. Everybody, what word? Yes, chopped. Spell chopped, get ready. What word did you spell? Yes, chopped. So there we can assume that a student made a mistake on the word chopped. Maybe they said chopper or chopped. And so I came right in with that correction. And then what I'm going to do is have them start over. Starting over, let's do it better. Starting with the first word. First word, what sound? What word? Yes, ranch. And I would go back through it again. Each time I hear a mistake, my turn, your turn, starting over. That's the basis of a correction. My turn, your turn, starting over. My turn, here's the sound. My turn, here's the word. And then your turn, repeat the sound or repeat the word and then starting over. Starting over is generally the beginning of a row or the beginning of a column. We don't leave a row or a column until it's been read clean. At the end of this big word attack, again, we would have individual terms where students would practice reading a row individually and they're challenged to get so many rows done correctly without making mistakes to earn points in the lesson that um, they can earn points for their lesson with. This is decoding C which takes it a little further and so I'm going to show you another activity here um, on how we use vocabulary. This is a uh, vocabulary exercise that we use in both reading mastery and in corrective reading, um, this is how we teach students about words. So we know that in order for students to really remember the meaning of a word, they have to use it in their everyday speech and language. So they're not just learning words and rote definitions, but they're learn how, going to learn how to use that word in speech and in language, and then they'll apply it in their workbook as well by using it in written sentences. Um, so what I want you to do is focus on part three. And again, thinking about how many times you're responding and how you're responding um, and just kind of being in that, again, in that suspension of belief that I've pulled you up to this. We started um, at a certain point based off of where you placed and I've pulled you up to this level through that 90% review, 10% new each day. Okay, so we're going to focus on part three and I'm going to start with word two. So everybody looking at word two, pretending that you're a student and you have this textbook in front of you and you're using a tracking finger. I'm looking around, seeing everybody tracking. Excellent job. That's some points for you on the board. And so let's look at word two. Everybody, what word? Yes, fluttered. Everybody eyes up, look at me. So now your eyes are off the book and they're on me. Listen, flutter is another way of saying move back and forth rapidly. What's another way of saying the leaves moved back and forth rapidly 
down to the ground. Get ready. Yes, the leaves fluttered to the ground, or you could have said leaves fluttered down to the ground. Okay, good. Now, what's another way of saying the leaves fluttered to the ground? Get ready. Yes, the leaves moved back and forth rapidly down to the ground. Now, again, if there were mistakes there within that choral response, I would fix it with a my turn, your turn starting over, which again is a unique feature of direct instruction. Um, but I'm going to go on and show you just one more example because I want to make sure I get through a couple more examples in our last couple minutes together. So let's now work at, we'll look at word three. Pretend to be my students again, everybody touching word three with your tracking fingers. I see good tracking fingers all the way around. So that's another couple points for you on the board. All right, word three, everybody. What word? Yes, snaked. Eyes up. Look at me. Snaked is another way of saying twisted. Everybody, what's another way of saying the road twisted between the mountains? Get ready. Yes, the road snaked between the mountains. Now think big, what's another way of saying the road snaked between the mountains? Get ready. Yes, the road twisted between the mountains. So again, that's a fun vocabulary exercise that we use in the upper levels of reading mastery signature and transformations. And also you see it in decoding C. Um, so here's another example of some corrections, and we're on our last few minutes together, so I want to get through these last couple slides and make sure I open it up to questions, but you can see that everything they do in a lesson, they practice. This is an early decoding A lesson where they're practicing listening for and writing sounds, uh, listening for the beginning sound to make the word mat or sat, um, sounding out and saying fast nonsense words. So anything that they do in the lesson, they're expected to be able to do in the workbook. And again, we have those correction procedures in place. Um, here are some examples of content that you might find in the comprehension program. I promised you those analogies. Here's a very simple analogy about ask is to inquire as weep is to cry. Um, but we also learned some really fun ones like, listen, all birds have feathers. An eagle is a bird. So what do I know about an eagle? Get ready. Yes, it has feathers. Listen to that analogy. All birds have feathers. An eagle is a bird, so an eagle has feathers. Now you finish it for me. All birds have feathers. An eagle is a bird, so Yes, an eagle, an eagle has feathers. Boy, my fingers didn't want to snap there that last time. Um, they learn how to um, separate things into actions, um, into uh, different classification skills. Um, and decoding uh, comprehension B1 and B2, we work on memory and we work on uh, building that memory in the brain um, through learning different types of body rules and body systems. They learn about all the organs and systems of the body. And so that helps build that auditory memory. Now, last but not least, and I know I'm on my last minute, and in fact, I'm over time. If you liked some of what you were seeing from Open Court earlier on in the program with those foundational skills kits, with the fun puppets and the sound spelling cards, but you also liked the unique scripted feature of direct instruction that had that tight script to help your um, teachers who might need help with teaching reading. We do have a combined approach that has the best of OCR and reading mastery combined. And that's through our early interventions and reading program our Intervenciones Tempranas de Lectura program. Um, and so early interventions in reading is a level K through two program that's gonna provide that intensive support. We actually call this our intervention uh, are actually our prevention slash intervention program because grade K is all about language development and then grades one and two get into those word attack skills, vocabulary and comprehension. Um, the Intervenciones Tempranas de la Tora uh, is a program that is designed to help students that are Spanish speakers. And so once they're done with this program, they're ready to go into early interventions and reading level two. So just some quick examples of what you might see um, in this program that is designed to prevent failure and promote literacy through that prevention and that intervention. They have word recognition and spelling. Um, they have letter sound, tricky words. They look at uh, word parts. They look at patterns. 
of the parts. So valve structures, CVC versus VCE. Um, and then getting into grade two, they look at multisyllabic words, endings, and morphology. So you see a lot of the good stuff that you saw in reading mastery where they practice sound combinations, but they also see them through some type of sound spelling card. Um, so here's some other examples. So we have our munching monkey. Um, we can see them practicing sounds on a um, on a display, and then we can see them reading about that muzzy monkey. Um, so there's that teacher holding up that sound spelling card again, and this is going to be a fan. Um, so again, they're going to have that motion attached to the sound. Um, so sound spelling cards that are similar to what you had in those foundational skills kits with those patterns still at the bottom to help them learn how those sounds appear in words, but also just all of that good stuff that we saw within reading mastery as well. They're still going to continue to work on fluency with early readers in grade one, and then they're going to work on chapter books and also nonfiction type reading in, in grade two or level two. Um, so I know I've gone really fast. Let me just check the chat box again. Um, so let me, first of all, um, you have my, um, my email address and my phone number here. So you please contact me if you have any questions about any of the programs you saw today, whether it was the Open Court Foundational Skills Kits, Reading Mastery, Corrective Reading, the Language Series, any of them. Um, and also, I just want to type in again, I hope it's going to work. Oh, it didn't. So let me just very quickly escape. I know many of you are having to go because you have to probably run Thank to the next session. Ripley, that was such an engaging session. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to type into the chat box one more time, that intervention page, and I'm going to drop in that tier oh, solution. I just send that picture. over. Okay, now, We great. have a, a couple of webinars that are running this month, and I've just dropped the link in the chat box. And I know there are a lot of people asking about these intervention programs. So briefly, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen instead. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. And if you're looking to get in touch with the intervention programs that Beverly has talked about, you can email us at marketing.mia at mheducation.com. That's the email address that you're seeing on your screen. So go ahead and email us if you're looking to find out more about this and we can connect you with a learning solution consultant that's in your region. Or if you have any questions at all regarding the session, you can email either me or Beverly, uh, and the email address is, is on your screen right now. Um, any more questions? Thank you so much. You were a fantastic audience. And I do want to remind you that we have other sessions that are running this uh, month. Just going to drop the link in the chat box for you in case you want to register. I know a few of the teachers wanted to attend the math intervention session, which is next week. So make sure you register on the link so you can be there. Okay, just going to, if you have any questions for Beverly, right, Beverly, we can, we can hand on if you, if you want to leave Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Um, Ahmed is saying, is there a certificate? Yes, there is a certificate of participation and you will receive it via email. So you will get the recording of this session to watch back and you will also get the certificate of the session as well. Uh, do you have any questions at all for me or Beverly? There's just lots of thank yous. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're so glad yes. that you enjoyed the session. And while we're waiting for a question, I just really quickly want to mention when you're looking in that tiered solutions brochure, which I dropped into the chat box several times, along with looking at that intervention website, which also I dropped that link in the box several times. We also have computer assisted instruction programs like Achieve 3000, Smart Ants. And so those are programs that um, obviously, the, the computer is going to be doing a lot of the instruction for your students. So we have um, something for every teacher, every learner, um, all the way from computer assisted instruction programs to those more soft, um, explicit programs like you saw with Open Court uh, Foundational Skills Kit and those um, more scripted programs like Reading Mastery. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nisma wants to know if there is a session tomorrow. Yes, there is a session tomorrow and we've just dropped the link 
to the other webinars that are running. But thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here. I would like to thank Beverly as well. Thank you so much. I know it was really early for you, but what a fantastic session. I learned so much. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Good. Thank you. It's it's tight to squeeze it all in an hour. So we were trying to keep you engaged, um, but also to give you some, some of the fabulous tidbits with our program as well and show you how we keep our learners engaged. <laughs> that is true. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Until next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.